All right, welcome to this edition of Firefighting Fridays. I'm Jeff Diedrich with Strategic Fire Training. And today's panel, of course, we have Jeff Shoup, Jerry Knapp, Chad Groover, and Micah Heidemann running out. And uh, today's topic is talking about the, the the unusual call for the engine company. Some of the things that we got to tackle going in first as an engine and solving different or bigger problems with just the simple equipment we have on the engine. So just getting started with a myriad of different calls and experiences. Um, Jeff, can you start us out with where you want to go with this tonight? Well, I, I can I can start out by saying no fire department exists without an engine. So since there's about 68 or thousand or so engines across the country and about 6,700 ladders, you can see where engines have the greater possibility of ending up at special incidents other than fires. So, uh, you know, you can see what's happened with some departments that don't have a, a good access to a large number of resources. So they take their engines and they turn them into something other than an engine, as we have talked about in the past. So you start seeing engines with bigger compartmentation, with all this equipment and so forth to handle different situations. So uh, I was I was kind of hoping that we could talk a little bit about different situations, which I think we will, but also about different fire situations. So I know with a couple of you guys uh, this past week, I discussed a couple of those uh, ideas. So I think I th I don't know. I hope that's a good start to yeah. uh, get us in the right frame of mind. So yeah, I like it. Uh, All right, good. Well, hey Jerry, mm -hmm. want to go first? What's uh, what's some of the unusual or I guess off center uh, calls you've been on with an engine? Well, let me bring up a couple slides here. It's probably a picture's worth a thousand words. So uh, let's see. So the engine. There's a hydro right in front of his house. Um, the, there's about four or five solar panels on fire, um, just the solar panels. Um, we got a guy inside who was nothing in the attic. So I have a 15, 16 smoothbore nozzle in the driveway. And I'm like, well, probably not good to put that on an electrical fire, which is what this is. So I'm like, well, I gotta do something. So I pointed the, the nozzle straight up in the air and um, made it rain and shut the nozzle off so I didn't have a continuous flow back to the, uh, um, you know, back to the nozzle of electricity. And I am having a hard time advancing these. Let's see. Hmm. So. Oh, yeah. Okay. It was, I was kind of over here. That's not me. That's somebody else. But I was over here in the driveway. With the, here's a line, right? So I just pointed up in the air and. And shut it on and off a few times and, and let it rain. I mean, that's 180 gallons a minute coming down. So it kind of rained on that and uh, knocked the fire down. We gave it a little uh, spritz underneath the uh, eave here just to uh, just to be sure that you know it wasn't extended into the attic. Um, this obviously an aerial view. You can see there's probably I don't know three or six three to six panels that were burning. And it was one of those things where like you got to do something. Um, you know, you just can't stay there and let the house burn down. Yeah. But so, any questions or discussion on that? Well, what's the uh, what's the makeup of these solar panels? Mostly uh, like a plastic or acrylic material, or? Yeah, you know, I don't really know. Uh, maybe you guys, maybe you guys can shed a little more light on that than than I can. Yeah, I, I don't. Really We've know. only got about 160 days of sunlight, Jeff, so we don't see much of this. <laughs> <laughs> We've had about three, I think, this winter. So uh, we, we, we've been getting rain like crazy. But anyway, yeah, so I, I don't know if that's a recommended practice or not. I can tell you it worked this time. Um, you know, I didn't get – I guess a couple important things to remember is that these residential solar panels, a typical residential solar system uh, generates about 600 volts. So, <clears throat> you know, if you had an attic fire or second floor fire, um, you want to be sure these are turned off. and Obviously, you can't turn them off unless there's a either a heavy black tarp on it or or something. So, if you got guys overhauling in, in the attic, excuse me, your second floor or wherever these high voltage lines come down, that's 600 volts. It's DC, so you're not getting a second chance. So, I just guess one of the things I'd remind guys is 
that's some that's some pretty serious juice. Um, Jer, I, I I got questions about that. Mm-hmm. Are you saying these are storage batteries? No, if there's light on the panels, there's somewhere around 600 volts coming down through the wiring to wherever it goes. So if that wiring <clears throat> comes down through the house, um, going to okay. the battery bank. To the yeah, to the battery bank or the meter or whatever. Um, you don't want guys messing around that wire. It's 600 volts DC. Uh, it'll cause you to clamp on. You know, if you got a metal pike pole, a metal hook, you know, uh, a halligan, whatever. Kind of kind of a bad day. Hmm. Yeah, there should be a transfer switch uh, mm-hmm. somewhere on that system that would interrupt or break the the flow of electricity into the house, but you know, where that is and who hooked it up and is mm-hmm. it reliable? I mean, yeah, anybody's guess. So you, Jeff brings up a good point. The transfer switch in this unit was down where my cursor is, down low. So those wires that were coming down through the attic and second and first floor were still energized. So Jeff, to your point, it could be de-energized here, but it's hot above that. Yeah. You know, kind of crazy stuff. So I got a punchline. Um, I found this stuff. It's called PV stop, photovoltaic stop. Um, and it <clears throat> it's a two and a half gallon extinguisher. It sprays like a, uh, I don't know, a rubberized, kind of a heavy paint, right, um, onto the panels and it shuts them off. So we this was a solar panel we had at the training center and and we bought a few of these PV stop extinguishers and decided to use one. Let's see if I can get this video to play. Uh-huh. So hmm. that's coming out of extinguish. It's got about a thirty foot range. Uh, we're putting we're putting way too much on. Uh, what we learned doing this is if you're going to use one of these things, uh, that much PV stop is probably good for three or four panels. Um, so we just didn't know any better. This was our first shot. So we if you if you're using this thing, really kind of like using a fire nozzle, move, move the nozzle around. And uh, this stuff um, sticks on like a rubberized coating, completely shuts off the power from the solar panel. Mm. And when it's dry, it dries in about five minutes. You can just peel it off like a kind of like a rubber glove or something. So it doesn't it doesn't damage the undamaged panels. Oh, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And it's commercially available, Jerry. It is. Uh, if you go to PV Stop, it was invented by an Australian uh, electrical engineer, actually. Um, FDNY has experimented with it. They've they bought some. I forget which units they put it on, but uh, um, they had a fire at a solar panel vehicle charging station, and because they couldn't stop the electricity, they couldn't stop the fire. So they called. I think maybe Hazmat has this. I'm not sure. Anyway, they called them, sprayed it. You know kind of turn the electric off and, you know, with the PV stop and, uh, uh, you know, allowed the electrical fire to go out. So. Oh, hmm. great idea. Do you know anything about the extinguisher then you get, that you guys had, like how much weight it carries and can it, it looks like a regular water, water, uh, pressurized water extinguisher. Mm-hmm. What do you do? Hook an air chuck up to it? And no, it? it's, it's just like a, a PW. Yeah. It's, it's preloaded, pull the pin, you know, aim, squeeze, what is it? Point aim, squeeze, sweep. So um, <clears throat> the bad news is they're not refillable. I want to say they're 400 bucks a piece. Um, but, um, I don't know, it's just something new. Uh, I, I kind of kind of like to experiment with it and, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, that might be a good thing. I know we're supposed to be talking about engines, but where I am, we have a lot of those solar panels on the roof like you are, like you just showed us. Mm-hmm. Let's put it in the bucket of your truck. Mm-hmm. Get up above it and spray it down. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, excellent. Hmm. So that that's my two cents. So yeah. So I, I guess I'm I'm questioning. So those things are charged if there's light on them. If there's light on them. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yep. Yeah, we never dealt with those in the city. You could see the little white lines on it that it was knocking out on the, your video, Jerry, mm-hmm. you could see the grid system in there mm-hmm. and then it was totally covering it. Yeah. 
That seems to cover it really well. Like I said, we we gobbed it up way too much. We we just didn't know. Um, but it seems like uh, you know, seems like something to think about. If at all, you really don't get anything out of that one. It's if you can cover the panels, you can stop the electricity. So correct. If it's a, a charging station, and you can get a tarp over it. Mm -hmm. You probably shut the electricity off. You know. Mm -hmm. What's the weight of those? Without any fire, just 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 as they sit up there in the roof, yeah. Because is there anything, yeah? You know, like for example, you take a look at these houses today with the truss roofs, and if there's fire in the attic, is there any weight that's going to uh, no it, be, be causing that, the that panel? I want to say it was three by eight or four by eight. It probably weighs twenty pounds, fifteen pounds. I mean, it's not. It's very no. thin. Yeah. yeah, there's really not much to it. It's got aluminum frame around it. Uh, a quick internet search says that they average 40 pounds. Okay. Yeah, I, I would think that the bigger hazard is the battery bank somewhere in that house. Mm -hmm. And if there's a fire going on somewhere in or around that area, that's going to be the that's going to be the choker right there. I just saw an ad today. Our utility company is giving away free battery packs to homeowners. So, you know, probably the same thing happened in other guys' areas as well. Yeah. I don't know. Somebody calls me at least once a week asking if I want to convert to solar power. Mm -hmm. Sure. Same here. Yeah, not here. A lot of sun <laughs> down here. A lot of sun. No. No. We, we don't have a lot of sun. We have a lot of liberals. So. No. <laughs> That explains the free batteries. Yeah, some yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Rate, rate pay, the rate payers are paying for them, you know? Oh. <laughs> oh my Actually, I, I can't resist I saying this. We we had a, a planning meeting with the local utility, and the guy was very proud that he had a, an electric car, and he insisted it was zero emissions. So when I said, well, where does electricity come from? You know, he goes, oh, no, it's zero emissions. And I go, oh, yeah, I got it, yeah. So... Where did they come up with the idea that it's zero emissions? They're talking about the end result. I, I agree. They're trying to, you know, they're not telling you what it takes to get to that end result. All the other stuff that's happening. Some somebody's burning something and making steam and spinning a generator to make his electricity that he's yeah. using. Yeah. But uh well, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. They're creating we, a job for firemen in the future. We, we we probably shouldn't go there. So yeah, let's not digress too much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, Chad or Micah, you guys got any oddball left or right of center calls with your engines that you can think of before we move on to the next one? Chad, I'll let you go. The only thing that I have in our city, we have a little bit of everything, but. The only thing that takes us out is that we're an airport. Our engines have to respond to the airport. And What's that like? Well, I mean, we have a big crash truck, too. Shoop's actually seen our crash truck. It's enormous. Um, but, uh, you know, it's different because, you know, I think I've been lucky. I've only been on major, maybe five or seven plane, five to seven plane crashes in my whole career. And <laughs> only? Oh, yeah. Well, you, when you're on an airport, I mean, that's not that bad over 25 years. Uh, you know, I'm averaging one every five years. Uh, and it's a it's a learning airport. So there's a lot of student pilots. So, uh, you know, once it crashes and is on fire, it's a fire. And we do have some 737s. The RF truck takes precedent. What you have to do when we're on the engine, we have to pull up beside because if it's a bigger airplane, since it's we never know what's coming in. It could be a 737. They're not chartered, so there's nobody paying to be on them, so they're private planes. But if there's smoke in there, then the engine company just acts like an engine company, goes in through the door and has to put it out quickly. So the big deal there is just trying to stay out of the way of the crash truck because they're going to protect they're going to protect the egress if there is if there are people going out, and then the engine has to be ready to go in with their lines. Gotcha. Yeah, that's a whole nother different that's, flavor or something. That's a whole there. different world. I was yeah. going to say, tell us about your extinguishing capabilities or what you use, from especially from your ARF truck. Hey, Jeff, can you move your mic up a little bit? There you go. Okay. 
Did you hear? Did you guys hear me that time? Yeah. So the ARF truck is a fifteen hundred gallon truck. Um, I want to say I haven't been on it in a while, but it it's got around a hundred gallons of foam on it. Um, you can do water, you can do water foam, you can do dry chem. They're really kind of trying to shut us down on the foam right now. So, oh god, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, it has to be. A, but you know, if you hit something with fifteen hundred gallons in ninety seconds, which is how long it takes to get rid of all that water, something's got to go out. <laughs> You know, the big hangar crash we had a couple of years ago, it, you know, once the ARF got there, it was pretty much over. And then it just became a regular structure firefight, the firefight. Gotcha. So on the airfield itself, where the runways are, yes, sir. do you have the below grade hydrants? Uh, no, we have six hydrants on the, they're not on the runway. There's like one at each end. And then there's, off the taxiways, you can get to the hydrants. Okay. So once once you get the RF truck there, you're going to have to, you know, we bring another one to come in. And right. once it's not, if you're not chasing the plane, once the plane stops, you're pretty much going to have to hook into whatever it is. And it could be a pretty long lay depending on where it hits. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And what kind of supply lines would you use then? Just the we, standard we supply five lines? We use five really? lines. Okay. And, uh, you know, and there's a big, and you and I have talked about this, there's a big discussion on whether we need foam on the engines. You know, we've always had foam on our engine. I think Engine 101 has a 1,000-gallon tank with 50 of it being foam that you can, you know, proportion out. And I've just kind of said, you know, I know we have the airport with everything they're going. We really don't use foam that much on the engine. I'd rather just, and if, if it's that bad, we're probably going to be doing it with our deck gun. And, uh, I just said, you know, we've talked about it. If you need foam, just give me a five gallon bucket of foam. I'll batch mix the whole tank and just, you want foam turn on anything. So. Good yeah. way to clean out the inside and all the seals of your pump. Yeah. You're going to be there for a while flowing. So you're going to have to flush for a long time, but anything that we're doing that on, you're going to have to flush yeah. anyway for a long, you're going to be flowing for a long time. It's like one of the three day fires that Dietrich talks about. <laughs> You'll have time to flush it out. Yeah, those do take a long time. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, I got a couple examples I'm going to try to go over. Oh, we um, missed Micah. You missed Miss Micah there, yeah, Jeff. Micah, do you want to you want to chime in? <laughs> Man, no, I'm. I don't really have much to share besides what we always have talked about: the troubles of water access, water supply. <laughs> Okay. I'm trying to think of a fire recently that it was more complicated. Uh, uh, maybe a locomotive. Oh, well, locomotives catch on fire. Uh, yeah. BSNF. That's Jerry. Yeah. You Jerry did. You wrote an article on that years ago. Yeah, I, I teamed yeah. up with a couple guys from the railroad. Um, but make a long story short, they the railroad guys describe a locomotive as a substation on wheels. Because exactly. The, yeah. yeah. Go, go ahead, Micah. No, that's, that's exactly right. And fortunately, this locomotive that was on fire, it was just in the wheel bearings down in the brake area on the axle. So uh, that was an easy hit. However, <clears throat> a week later, there was another locomotive that got on fire. And that was more complicated, just like what you said, Jerry. It's, it's a substation on wheels, and mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to be on that nozzle hitting that with the solid stream. No, no. The uh, our CSX locomotives, which is the main line that runs through the county here, if there's a lightning bolt below the engineer's uh, window, that's thirty thousand volts. Oh, uh, so, Jesus! Yeah, yeah. So that diesel generator spins a spin. That diesel uh, engine spins a generator, and yeah. Um, yeah. there's there's some juice there. Yeah, yeah. The good the good news is there's a shutoff on each side of the locomotive. There's a red typical emergency mm -hmm. shutoff. Uh, you have to hold that till the engine stops because there's a fuel cut off, and there's one behind the uh, uh, engineer stand in the in the cab as well. It's just typical red, you know, emergency shut off. But shut yeah. off for shut off before you put water on it. Which I, I'm kind of surprised these new locomotives that are coming out. They don't have a suppression system on them. I asked, mm -hmm. like, do you guys have any kind of clean agent suppression system? <laughs> no, no. Hmm. 
No, well, <laughs> millions of dollars of commerce, but uh, no. yeah. And there's 5,000, 5,000 gallons of diesel sitting underneath it, like three inches off the tracks, you know, no kidding, man. I, I so. was just going to ask what the volume is for their fuel mm. tank. Yeah. 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 It's, it's wild. It's, it's a missile on wheels. <laughs> <laughs> it's a heavy missile on wheels. Yeah. Yeah. Ask so, in Ohio about that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, recently that's been the more special ops of an engine company. But in, in my short time here at this fire department, it's uh, water access is more challenging. Like, you can throw any special ops at any engine company. It all goes to hell if you don't have water. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. I, I, was, I was just having a discussion today with a fireman, Jeff, you know him, uh, about what we learned out in Iowa with those big engine tankers. I think they got about 3,000 gallons of, of water in their tank, and they build an engine. And then they build the engine around it, like the four-door cab, the side-mounted pump panel, the cross lays, and then the top of the hose beds. And that's it. Those things are huge. So I was showing him a picture of, of what we uh, trained with uh, several years ago when we used to go to Iowa. And uh, I says, you know, these guys are set up for agricultural fires. And some of those farms, you're going to drive down a dirt road, maybe a mile to get back into those farms and so forth. So they have all these big hydrants on wheels, send them, sending them in, you know, to go in there initially. So yeah. Jerry would not be able to reach the hand lines on those. No, no. <laughs> I have to stand on your shoulders, Chad. <laughs> I don't think I could reach the hand, the hand lines on those. That's what you got the loops for. Yeah. Big loops. <laughs> yeah. Dietrich, what do you got, man? So, I'm curious. Well, just a couple different uh, things here. So what you're looking at there is uh, a young firefighter with an SCBA tank, and he uh, puts the uh, threads into that nozzle, opens up the bale, and you open up that tank and lo and behold, you make that uh, fire hose full of air and you close the nozzle and now mm. you have a buoyant, uh, somewhat rigid uh, fire hose. If you get, you have that call where you got uh, somebody's driven into the uh, retention pond behind Walmart or maybe there's a pond or a flooded uh, underpass and there's a way to, to stretch a line beyond the person that's in trouble, you could send somebody with the, the nozzle in that tank and uh, you can make sure that the, the hose will float and then maybe you could pull each end around so that uh, the victim can grab it. You know, maybe you can, you know, have you ever heard the, the moniker, you're gonna reach, throw and row before you go, right? You don't wanna get into the water unless you absolutely have to. And this is a way to reach them or throw to them and, you know, if. Uh, if you can stretch that line, you know, beyond them, then you can uh, maybe try this. So different ways of doing it. Uh, I've seen companies where they have specific fittings um, so that they can, you know, rip off, you know, a few hundred feet and they'll use like their pneumatic uh, tools that you know some people have either the Paratex system or some kind of lifting bags where they have uh, set up to use pneumatics and then they would just get the fittings they need for hoses but this here is just about what every fire department could or should have which is a smooth bore nozzle and an scba tank and um that's about all it takes mm. you know to fill up that line that's pretty cool hey Diedrich, how how much hose how many feet will that fill will one bottle fill do you know well the the inch and three quarter i mean I've seen 400 feet filled up, no problem. Uh, it's all about volume. I think if you went with two and a half, you might have to do some experimenting. Um, but, you know, we, we have, the back of our engines are, are set up like a war wagon. You know, we, we have 700 feet of inch and three quarter at our disposal off the back. 
plus we have some cross layers with cobwebs that we could put in service if we needed to as well. So how do you, how do you call it? Do you just put a cap on the other end? Uh, you can just plug it right to your pump. Okay. Or to a gated Y and shut it or whatever. Yeah. Pretty simple little thing that could help you in a jam. If you got somebody in the water somewhere that you need to get something to them, you know, do, do you have to wrap that around Jeff or could you just shoot it out straight to them? Cause it's going to float. Straight out the threads of the uh, cylinder. No, I mean the ho oh. the after you inflate it to get it to the victim, can you just float it straight out to them? Yeah, I mean, depending on your situation and current, yeah, absolutely. Or you could, uh, you know, if you can walk somebody around the pond mm. with that hose line, um, and then they could fill it up once they get on the other side of the pond, and then it's just a matter of pulling it around and. Kind of snatching them up. Mm. Just a different way to to get to somebody. Yep. Yeah, we've, taken, we've, we've taken a rope and secure the bale and take it. You know, throw the rope bag across. That's how pull pull the hose across. Yeah. I guess you could use it for yeah, ice rescue too, right? Just push it push right. it out across the ice, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ice rescue, water, yeah, anything anything you gotta like really get to somebody that's kind of far away, it's it's an option. Hmm. Yeah. It's pure yeah. give it a try and mess around with it, man. It's it's yeah. It's surprisingly hmm. simple. I don't think we'll have an ice problem down here, but no. Okay. Well, yeah. you do actually once a year you do. <laughs> <laughs> we, we we seem to remember some texting really complaining about ice. What a year ago, we, were, we heard some whining and crying going on. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> we we wanted to feel sorry for him, but no, it just wasn't uh, there. I'm sorry, I do not recall. <laughs> hey, and FYI, so you were asking about volume of the the hose sure. and uh, how much air. Jeff, are these 40 cubic foot cylinders? Is that what they hold approximately? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> huh? Yes. Okay. Uh, there's 231 cubic inches of water in a gallon. So if we are looking at replacing that with air, uh, there's a, in a, what the heck is it? A, uh, what would we say? A 50 foot length of inch and three quarter weighs about 53 pounds. Right. Divide yeah. that. 53, 56 pounds. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, so divide that by your 8.3 and you'll see, you know, you only got a, a few, few uh, gallons of water in there in that 50 foot length of hose. Six uh, point three. Convert that to air. So you can see that cylinder right there is going to give you, like Jeff said, you can go 400 feet with no problem. Especially for the inch and three quarter hose. So, like I say, just an FYI. Yeah, appreciate the math so, real quick there. That's yeah. Good. Wow. I'm a public school graduate. <laughs> back, back when school worked. Barely. <laughs> Try that. that Barely. That like pure D witchcraft to me. But. <laughs> speaking Witch of witchcraft, <laughs> uh, this, speaking of witchcraft, this next photo is there's some firefighters with some ropes and a ground ladder. Um, I would think that th there are some companies out there that, that initially get taught to do some type of, you know, vertical rescue using the ladder as a gin pole type scenario here. Uh, we're, we're using rope as guy lines to tie it back to the engine. And then just any kind of simple mechanical advantage you may have at your disposal. Um, it, not sure what's going on in everybody's town, but we do carry a fair amount of rope equipment. We do have a park system in our first due. We do, uh, I would say three to a half dozen park rescues a year. And, um, so this stuff comes off our engine quite a bit. So with that, our crews are practiced and, you know, I have them work on three different knots and that's it. Um, uh, we tie as little as possible and pre-rig wherever we can, but, um, Clove hitches, figure eights, and bowlins will get you through just about anything you really need to do. Thank you. And then this example here, we've got the 24 footer uh, butted at the, uh, the rear tire of the engine. Uh, we're using one piece of rope as a 
as a guy line, it's tied back. Then there's a couple of figure eights that are looped around the beams of the ladder. Hey, Jeff, Jeff, we're not, we're not seeing the your bottle. slide. What's that? I'm still on the air bottle slide. Are you really? I'm looking yeah. at this other one. I think if you double click on a slide, that's what I had to do. Oh, there, there you go. go. Okay. Yeah. So you can see how this that blue rope is our is one rope, and then the orange is the other. So pretty simple setup for us. Yeah. Um, just a couple of knots and some rope here, and we're ready to go. We're ready to pull something up out of that uh, that sewer uh, vault right there underneath the truck. Just a quick down and dirty, throw the three to one. Yeah, you're pulling it up. There's not a break. There's not a belay. But if you're trying to yank somebody up six, eight feet, and there's four of you standing there, this is something that's absolutely possible. So all things considered, you know, if it's a confined space, is it, are they engulfed? Are they, you know, taken by some uh, oxygen deprivation? Or did they just fall down the ladder and break their leg? You know, what's the case? Uh, as far as getting somebody up and out of there. So initial engine company could really make a difference here on getting somebody up out of a jam. And uh, the possibilities are, are, you know, there's quite a few where you may need to do something like this. So even if it's just lifting something heavy off of somebody, you could, you could potentially get that done here. This would work better with a four to one versus a three to one, but I just asked my firefighters to come up with a, a mechanical advantage and they train a lot on just setting up at three to one Z drag. So that's what they did. So, okay, good enough. You need to pull somebody up a few feet. You could definitely do it. So hey Jeff, I, I saw at FDIC a couple of years ago, a thing called a sling link. Yeah. That's it's... been out for a long time. That was a uh, mm. Jim McCormick, uh, child i believe when i was doing writ back in the early 2000s quite a bit that's where i found it it was called a mast sling device from the mm -hmm. I believe in the military and um the fire service one is multi-looped it's five loops of webbing different colors uh red for the legs and yellow for the arms and a green for a overhead cinch and it works really well Mm -hmm. especially in a hasty harness situation like this, they're perfect. Mm -hmm. And um, we keep one of those with our RIT kit, and that is absolutely what we would use in this situation if we had to get down and put put it on somebody to, to get them up and over something. Mm -hmm. It's a great device. Another thing that device is good for is the bag that you keep the sling link in mm -hmm. is really good for your hydrant, uh, your water can rope bag. Yep, it is. Perfect. You can put that you can put that case right on your strap for your water can and hold fifty feet of rope really well. Yeah. Hey, if you can't do at least two things with it, it's worthless in the fire service. So No. Oh. <laughs> Boy, I've learned something here. There you go, boss. <laughs> hey, I got a question for you. And this goes back a long time. You see where your ladder's tied off on the engine. Yeah. You have any preference or any reason to tie it off to whatever. If you remember a lot of the old engines had the eye hooks, the big, you know, what they one one and a quarter inch uh bolted things that would sit in the bumpers of your engines. You know, like tow hooks is what they are. Yeah. In the front and the rear. And you know, guys told me when I was uh, learning this stuff to stay away from the grab rails. Don't tie off to them. What's your right. take on that? Absolutely. I think the grab rails are they're only rated for maybe 100 pounds of pull, and they're ah. subjected to all the weather and corrosion. And um, this particular setup here is on the overhead ladder rack, which is – not only hydraulically powered, but it has pneumatic uh, steel pins that when you put it in the lock position, the steel yeah. pins go all the way through this uh, steel channeling. So that thing ain't going anywhere. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well done. Yeah. You can see how this rope, I don't know if you could tell, but 
There's a figure eight on a bite yeah. here. There's a few arm lengths between it, and then there's another figure eight and a bite, and that's all we're using to just go over the tips of the ladder there. And it makes it makes a nice uh, long angled area for the mechanical advantage to hook to. Um, you're not you're not on the rungs. Uh, the rope is is taking that force and splitting it. So it works really well. Witchcraft, right? Mm -hmm. Rope stuff. <laughs> Does she have Again. a pointed hat? What's that? No, never mind. <laughs> so just a couple different looks at different things to do on the engine. I, one of the other topics I, I could bring up is uh, going on hazmat calls with uh, your engine when you're first doing on a hazmat call. Uh, <laughs> Man, don't, don't be in a hurry to get off your engine. And if you do, make sure your gloves are on and your air packs on and you're ready to turn your mask, put your mask on. Because I uh, had a couple of calls over the years going to some chemical companies. And when you see workers doing the zombie walk off the property, you better pay attention to that and keep yourself out of harm's way. You know? Setting up mass decon, a perimeter. These are things that as a first do engine, you may have to do maybe even divert a flow of something that's coming out of a tank. Have to think about some options, how you might want to do that. Whether it's set out some large diameter, cap it and fill it. You can make a little dike and try and keep some flow in a certain area. I mean, there's, it depends on, on the go gettingness of the, the crew that's there. We're all supposed to be, tuned up to an operations level here in Ohio, but maybe it's different where you're at and you got to be a technician. And if that's the case, then you really should have an idea of what you would do rolling up first do on a hazmat call. I think a lot of that comes back to once again, your training and so forth, checking where the wind is approach from the uphill upwind side, just as a matter of, you know, a fact of doing it coming in that way. So, yeah. Jerry, you've got a lot of experience with hazmat. What's some of the things you might have said over the years to engine company crews? This is one of my favorites. I, I had been in the department, I guess, about a year, and we were doing a walkthrough of the local chemical company. So I was all bright eyed and bushy tail, right? And uh, I see this spherical tank. It's probably 30 or 40 feet high. And uh, you know, that's pretty cool. And this company made, um, uh, you know, they mix chemicals and it was a precursor. They would send it down a line for, you know, another company to, to use. <clears throat> so I noticed around this tank, there's a post and like a little birdhouse. And I, I said, it was like four or five of these around that tank, you know. So I asked the, I go, I don't get the birdhouse thing. Oh, the guy's like, I'm really glad you asked. That's our cyanide tank. So if that's leaking, when you come racing down here, go to the birdhouse, get the flare gun, and light it on fire because that makes it non-toxic. So about then I'm going, I don't know about this fireman thing. You know, this is, <laughs> probably isn't so good, you know. <laughs> but, uh, Whoa. Yeah, it's like, holy crap, you know. But, uh, you know, Jeff, to your point, you roll into a chemical company. These people work with this stuff all the time. Yeah. And, and you know, we're – sometimes fat, dumb, and happy. And it's like, holy crap, you know, it's, it's bad stuff. Yeah. Yeah. There's going to be any surprises in your first do. So if there's one in there, you better yeah. have an idea of what you're going to do if uh, you're called there. Yeah. 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 Have a plan, work the plan. You know, up by us, um, our engine companies, pretty much everybody has a foam line. And, and to, to Chad's point, uh, the five gallon bucket of concentrate with a 95 gallon mini ductor with the nozzle that matches it. I mean, I think that's for us, that's, I don't know, that's an operation that every engine company should be able to be able to, to function with. And, and obviously you got two, three, four, five buckets of foam. It's not going to last real long. You figure. Nope. We lost your Lost you. Lost you. Uh, got me now. Yeah. You got two, three gallon, but you got two, three, four, five gallons of foam. It's not going to last very long. Go. Okay. Thanks, director. <laughs> so a couple of um, 
you know, a couple of minutes per five gallon bucket at a hundred gallons a minute. But uh, we train our guys to like, for example, at a gasoline tank, a truck rollover or whatever, cut a rescue path, you know, try to save life with you can, you know, if you can, um, obviously you got an automobile entrapment or something with fire, you know, you can use it there as well. But uh, a foam, op- a handline foam operation is a standard operation for us. A couple of important things, uh, generally around 200 PSI going into the ductor because it's using so much energy to suck that foam out. And depending on what nozzle you got on the end, usually want somewhere around 100 PSI to generate some bubbles at the end. Um, so that's kind of a, a standard operation for us. What's some of the limitations, though? Um, you're talking about a hand line, so we're putting firefighters in the engine within, you know, 400 feet of the the problem. Mm-hmm. So, at what point do you look at the problem and say that's that's beyond our hand line yeah. foam capability? You mentioned right. a tanker or a truck, but yeah, I mean, I mean, that's the key. You got to know what. It's just like applying water to fire. You know, you don't use a booster line at a at a structure fire because you don't have enough flow. Same thing with foam. Um, the good rule of thumb that, that I was taught was whatever your your nozzle, your foam nozzle um, flow is, put a zero on the end of it, and it'll handle a spill fire of that square footage, right? So if you got a 95-gallon in a nozzle, it'll handle nine, 950 square feet of a spill fire, not in depth, which isn't a lot. What's that, you know? 20 by 50 is a thousand square feet, I guess. So you're right, Jeff, you got to know the limitation and it's something you got to practice with just like you guys do with the rope. You know, I mean, that's great. You got those guys tuned into that. They need to be tuned into their, their phone line too, and, and know what it can do and what it can't, you know, the other thing we see real quick, and I don't want to get carried away here, but oh, sure. um, when um, guys, if, you know, if, if they're, they don't think water is going to work, they put foam on it. Well, Foam is for flammable liquids, right? It, foam is for flammable liquids. It's not for whatever you think, right? So it's kind of a specific tool that the engine, I think, in our, in our area, in my county, uh, you, you know, we, we used to have flammable liquid pits at our training center and, and guys would apply foam there. And it was just, just something we did. Yeah. A couple of things. Uh, number one, I'm a believer in the adductor. What mm-hmm. Jeff brought up is a very important thing. How long is an inch and three quarter foam line supposed to be coming from the adductor to the nozzle? Mm-hmm. Was it 150 feet? Yeah, mm-hmm. that's the max. Okay, mm-hmm. so you have engines that have they 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 say they got foam capabilities and they got 200 foot preconnect. And the other thing is you pump, you're you right on, Jerry, about that 200 foot going into the adductor to draw out that concentrate. Mm-hmm. And yet they're pumping at the old uh, pump pressure. Mm-hmm. So you're turning white water out there in a lot of cases. Okay. But the thing from a t- strategic and tactical standpoint, so we were talking earlier about coming into an incident, approach from the uphill upwind side. And do you want to have your engine and your people and all your people around that engine up that close to that problem. And that's where I'm a firm believer that, no, we shouldn't have uh, built-in foam capabilities. We should have that eductor on there so we can hook it into like a two and a half, stretch it to where we're going to operate, and then mm-hmm. use your 150 feet of inch and three quarter off of that mm-hmm. to deliver that foam. But, you know, you we, we find so many cases and you've seen them over the years – Every, every so often you see an engine that's burned up because they were right there in the spill zone or whatever, or the vapors took off, you know, and they couldn't get away. And you guys know the story. And uh, to me, that that's, you know, one of the basics of the engine operations, being able to create a foam line at a distance. We talk about the two and a half and the uh, it being the king of hose lines because of its versatility. Now it can act as a supply line for that eductor Mm-hmm. Down, down the way, you know. Mm-hmm. So, uh, the other thing is foam capabilities. At one time, I don't know if they're still doing it, but we had several engines. I think it was ten engines were set up with the big foam hydrofoam nozzles, the five hundred gallon a minute nozzles, and uh, 
they had the big pickup tube. I think the, inch, the, the, the pickup tube was like an inch and a half. So you guys talk about going through foam. You know, you had to have a, a like one of those little uh, blow up swimming pools. And you filled it up and you bred, had all these companies bringing their foam uh, buckets and dump them in there because just like that, if you were going to go from one five gallon container to another, well, your stream was going to go plop, plop like that. And uh, you just wanted to have that consistency. Like you t- so you took something as simple as one of those swimming pools and marshal all your foam concentrate in there and then draw from that when you start your application. Mm-hmm. So, uh, one of those, yeah, one of those lost arts, man. Not a lot of people practicing anything like that now. You know? yeah. Yeah. Well, Here, Ron, I'm, go Ron Gore from Jacksonville yeah. told me something a long while ago. He was a, a crusty uh, engine slash hazmat guy, and and he called it the combined agent attack. You know, let's say you get a helicopter, news helicopter, something goes down, you got people trapped, there's fuel leaking. You know, maybe you got a car accident, industrial accident, whatever it might be. Use your use your fog spray in the engine to push that fire away. Use the dry chem, uh, either a combination with that or before or after it to knock down the fire. You get that quick knockdown with the dry chem. And then your third step is, you know, seal it up with, with, with a little bit of foam you got. So you're using, you know, you had a couple of 20-pound dry chems on the rig. You, hopefully you got at least one. I'm not a big fog guy, but you got one fog nozzle for, for those yeah. kind of fires. And then, uh, you know, you got your foam nozzle. So three, those agents together can, or sequentially could do a, do a pretty good job for an engine company. It really, you right. wouldn't think would have much flammable liquid firefighting capability, you know? Yeah. I yeah. haven't heard about that yet. That's, that's a good one. So combined, like combined agent attack. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. But like the, the military use it, for example, I don't know if they're still using it, like on aircraft carriers, they'd have a foam line, and Chad probably knows more about this, but a foam line over a uh, dry chem line or, or vice versa, I forget which is which. Yeah, we have a, the dry chem is actually carried by the water line. And so it's got a dual okay. handle. Mm-hmm. So you turn on your water and then you turn on your dry chem and it carries in the center of the water. Wow. Yeah, that's a great idea. So you get a little cooling, you get a little fast knockdown, you get a little bit of everything. Using the purple K. Oh boy. Yeah, haven't heard purple K in a long time. Yeah, purple. It's not a Kansas. It's not a Manhattan, Kansas. It's not a Kansas yeah. purple thing. Not a Kansas purple K. Jesus, the Mary Harden purple. Do you guys see this? What do you got there, Jeff? It, it's a cutout from. 1985. Can you guys hear me? Can, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, now we can. Yeah. It's it's a news clipping of an incident uh, it was on back in January of 1985. And if you're familiar with uh, downtown Cleveland, they got the river flats and down there, you know, they got the Cuyahoga River and all the big barges come in and the boats come in and all that other stuff. But they also got uh, a bulk storage of... Uh, yeah, you know, like Shell Oil's got a big facility down there. This tanker was coming up the hill and was going to go out throughout the city. And the trailer flipped right over, as you can see in this right here. Flipped right over among all the big buildings, you know, right there in downtown. Why I was going down there, you know, well, it was still legal at that time. And... It, it's interesting because this person who wrote this uh, and submitted it for submission along with this picture was was from the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District. So you've got a, a full gasoline tank truck laying on its side. It's below zero. Comes in at 7 o'clock at night. And it was like, what are we going to do? And the the assistant chief coming in because the battalion comes in, then the battalion gets an assistant chief also made a second alarm right away. So strategically, it was planned. We had the chance of knocking out a whole bunch of buildings, you know, if this thing would have lit off. So they surrounded this incident at a distance with engines, hooked them up to hydrants and just pointed their deck guns without throwing any water. 
but the foam blanket was laid all over the engine and all over the ground and all over the uh, fuel that had spilled out. Pulled up another tank truck right alongside as this other one's laying on the side. The two were bonded together and then grounded. And then they had uh, one of these companies come in. They brought their anti-sparking bill uh, drills in and so forth. And we determined who's going to do what and how it's going to play out. So we had a hose line playing on the top of the tank while this gentleman from uh, uh, this uh, recovery company, he's got his big drill up there, and they're going to drill right into the tops of the tanks as it's laying there. Yep. And so you had a guy handing up the tools standing in about six inch, six inches of gasoline. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> that was my duty. And everyone else had backed away. So we got our nozzle man up there and we just, we, cause that was, that was the game plan. I mean, limit everybody's exposure, you know? Right. And we had enough foam. And the other thing about foam, Jer, you know, Jeff, is that you apply and you reapply. You apply and you reapply. Because, you, my God, you know, we, we, like I said, we were sloshing around. And it's, you know, your turnout gear. It's wicking it. So you've got you to have whatever. Do whatever you can. Again, this is 1985. So anyways, the holes were drilled. The, the, the tube was inserted in. And, of course, the tanker was offloaded to the waiting tanker and it was it it went according to plan we were so fortunate afterwards at the critique <laughs> they had shell oil with their recovery team there and they said boy guys you really did a great job the other people who were doing all this stuff and then you know all this was the barrier the way everything was set up the cops cordon off the whole area that was really great we says well have you guys ever been involved with that before we says no <laughs> it was the first time we ever did it it was like oh my god you know and you know you, you talk about firemen having luck with them <laughs> i think that was one of those nights yeah. but uh yeah it was uh, really something to to do all that and you know you're cutting into that trailer well that was the idea of the hose even with the, the non-sparking uh, drill bits and things like that. So that's where the training comes in. But until you do the real thing, you know, <laughs> you just hope it goes according to plan. And uh, we lucked out. So that's still uh, the widely accepted practice, right, Jerry? Is to drill and pump off if the yeah, trailer we, we, is. Yeah, we call it a stinger operation, and it it's aluminum tank, so it drills pretty yeah. easy. The yeah. grounding and bonding is what takes time because you yeah. gotta be, if you're driving grounding rods and stuff, uh, we look for utility poles. If there's a ground on that, we'll use the ground that's you know at the base of the utility pole. Um, we I always quiz my hazmat guys. We have two sets of dome clamps. So Jeff, the 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 gasoline was probably coming out of the domes oh, on yeah. those. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, and Jeff, do you probably have them on your hazmat team as well? There's, it's kind of like a C clamp, but it's a little bit right. different. That so I always quiz the guys, where are they? You know, well, I'm not really. Go find them. And there's there's in the front compartment of each of our rigs is a set of dome clamps just for that reason. Yeah. Uh, we used them probably about five years ago. We had a diesel truck overturn. It was a straight body diesel. We slapped those babies on. We're like, good. You know, really? Yeah, yeah. Dome dome clamps. Yeah. So have they, meaning the manufacturers of the trailers, have they created the dome clamps so if the trailer does tip over, that the uh, domes don't get pushed by the product, pushed open? I, yeah, I can't answer that. I, I know the yeah. domes are clamped down, but these are these are like free. You just clamp them on and screw them down. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I don't know. Maybe Jeff D. knows about more about domes than that. Oh, I it, depending on the cap, they could be vented depending on what their design mm -hmm. is for. And, you know, you're going to get leakage through the vents and mm -hmm. yeah, there's, there's different applications for yeah. it. We just had that tank truck 
you know, just a few miles down the road from my house here, Jeff, I called him yeah. that day to ask him if he had been on that call where that tank truck loaded with oh, several, well, 7,000 gallons, they said, yeah. of diesel fuel went right over the bridge. And of course, you know, that, at that point, you know, well, it's all over. But yeah. yeah. And that was on a, the interstate highway. Yeah. That was a light for a couple of hours. It was burning oh, yeah. for a long time. Wow. Yeah. Tragic. Yeah. Well, I think we've rounded out some uh, interesting, interesting calls for uh, your engine company. Maybe it sparks a conversation or gets somebody thinking about something that they've done that that's a little bit left of center for an engine company, but just be aware that, uh, like Jeff said, we're, we're the heart of the fire department. And when somebody calls for help, it's usually the engine that's showing up first and, uh, guys gotta be ready to make a plan quick with what you got, depending on what you're looking at. So anybody else got anything to add? If not, we're going to wind this up. Jerry, Jeff. Oh, yeah, good. Jed, Michael. Okay. How long have we been doing it? About an hour. Yeah, about an hour, hour okay. already. Okay. All right. All right. Well, yeah. guys, thanks for uh, adding what you had there. I uh, appreciate it. And uh, hope everybody else at home has got a chance to take something away. So um, you can still get us at uh, strategicfiretraining.com. Hit the contact. Mm -hmm. You can email us and or get us on Facebook. Yep. Yep. All right. Hope to see you guys in the future. I'll be safe. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.